Thank you for inviting me. Okay, uh, this morning we have seen uh, uh, some examples of analogs in connection with the giant planets and with icy moons. And this afternoon we are going to see more analogs, uh, more subjects related with geology, uh, with geology sensu stricto and also planetary geology and astrobiology, and analogs uh, connected or linked to the exploration of Mars, because Mars for the moment is the best example that we have to make this type of comparison. Also for the features of the planet during its first stages of uh, geological evolution. So I'm not going to, to give you a very detailed uh, representation of all the uh, different terrestrial analogs, because uh, uh, it would be a lot of time. But my goal for this talk is to provide a general overview about the main features of the terrestrial analogs, why they are important for the exploration of Mars and other planets, and uh, well, the state of the art, and what, what it's in my opinion more important, not the information that you can find on the books, but the information, my information, my own work, after more than 20 years of uh, work on uh, uh, terrestrial analogs uh, in different parts of the world. Not only in Spain, because you know in Spain uh, we have a very rich geodiversity which is very well recognized uh, by the scientists, uh, uh, but uh, in different parts, in the Antarctica, in uh, Atacama, in Iceland, many other places in which I was very lucky and I was able to work. So I think this information is more important or more relevant than the information that you can find in, in, in any book about these terrestrial analogs. So this is the, the, the outline of my talk. After this brief, brief introduction, some brief remarks about uh, uh, planetary analogs, planetary geology, because planetary geology was a pioneer discipline for the, for the description and the identification of these terrestrial analogs, these earth analogs, as I'm going to explain right now. And also what's the state of the art and some references, important references about earth analogs uh, and how they are applied to the investigation of mainly of Mars, because Mars, as I said, is the best, ex is the best example. I'm going to speak a little bit about this Earth-Mars comparison, uh, identifying some geological environments uh, to, to describe some analogs and, of course, this scientific personal approach. And I'm going to, uh, to end my talk with the special case in which we are working right now. Uh, in fact, we were working the last week, and uh, uh, this is a uh, a current work in connection with the European Space Agency connecting the uh, terrestrial analog of uh, Lanzarote, which is a UNESCO global geopark, also and, uh, in connection with the training of uh, astronauts of the European Space Agency. In this sense, in, in this regard, I have brought uh, a video, a movie, which is going to be a first because uh, the European Space Agency has not, has not distributed the video yet. Probably it will be distributed this week or the next week, but uh, they gave me a copy of the video for presenting here the video. Okay, So you will be the, the first people in the world who, who are going to, to see this, this video about our work training astronauts in the terrestrial analog of Lanzarote. So this is just an information about my, my institution is the, is the Institute of Geoscience. Uh, the IGEO was established in 2011, aiming to unify all research institutes and group of geosciences at a single institution in Madrid. We have uh, three departments, uh, 15 research groups, and we are around 130 members. Uh, the IGEO is a joint center of the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, is the Research Council of Spain, and the Complutense University of Madrid. To my knowledge, is the only institution which is at present 
a joint center of both uh, organizations. This is the website of my research group that I'm leading now. It's Meteorites and Planetary Geoscience. We are involved in space missions, the study of terrestrial analogs, and of course also doing some experimental modeling. And we also house in the IGEO, the Spanish Planetology and Astrobiology Network. At present, we are the delegates of Spain in EANA, in the European Astrobiology Network Association. We are routing this representation between the Centro de Astrobiología, the CAB, in which I was many years, uh, some years ago, and the uh, Redespa. So one of the peculiarities of our institution is that we are uh, participating by official agreement in the NASA MSL mission, in the rover in the Curiosity mission, and also in the European Space a Agency ExoMars. You know that it's a plan for mm, 2020, and also the NASA Mars 2020 in the SuperCam instrument, which is led by uh, Professor Roger Beans, and also in other projects like Biosign or Biomex. So this is a brief introduction about our institution. I have brought this uh, slide because I, I like it very much, because it represents very well two important aspects in the context of, of uh, planetary geology and the study of terrestrial analogs. One is, a, of course, the first one is the significant role of women in, a, in, in her involvement, in their involvement in science and, te and technology. I think this is uh, something very paradigmatic but I think it's extremely important how a, whim, a, a woman astronaut, uh, Karen Niebuhr, is able to see our planet from above. So I think this is very important from uh, the social and the cultural point of view, and also in the context of the planetary analogs, because we are seeing the Earth not only as a model, as a system, but also we are seeing the Earth as a potential model for other planets. So it's, it's a change of our perspective. So I think this, this, this is like is, is very important in this sense. Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, this was the pioneer of the concept of terrestrial analogs, was Dr. Eugene Shoemaker. Uh, the concept uh, goes back to 1962 because, uh, well, he was a, an expert on astronomy and also on geology. Uh, well, he wanted to be named as an astrogeology, so he was the founder of the astrogeological group in, in the United States. He was a real pioneer about these studies, and he proposed the definition of planetary geology and astrogeology, which is still active in the USGS astrogeology research program. And as you see in the definition, he proposes the following. Planetary geology aims to study at many different scales the origin, evolution, and distribution of the condensed matter in the universe in the form of planets, moons, asteroids, comets, and particles of different sizes and genesis. It involves the incorporation of results from spacecraft data analysis, laboratory simulations of various planetary processes, and of course, and this is the important part for, for this talk, and field studies of features on Earth analogs. So, he was a real pioneer about the study of, of these terrestrial analogs, and I think it, it was important to bring the figure of Professor Shoemaker here. Well, this is Professor Shoemaker that probably you know he was working in the Barringer Meteor Crater in Arizona, was the first, uh, the first structure which was identified as a cosmic structure not without difficulties, of course, because, well, this is another story. This is the Baring Meteor Crater. And here, uh, all the studies related with planetary analogs were uh, connected with the training of the astronauts in the Apollo, in the, for the Apollo mission. So you, you can see here the old times in black and white with the astronauts moving, not only in the meteor crater, but also in the volcanic craters and lava flows of the San Francisco volcanic field. What we are trying now, after 50 years, uh, to do again in Lanzarote and in many other parts with the ISA astronauts. Okay, so far, and I think this is very important because the Earth and, and, and Mars uh, are 
totally different planets, they share some aspects, some geological aspects, not only in connection with the material, uh, materials and processes, but also in connection with the evolution, the age, is a terrestrial planet. But I think it's important to, uh, to, to stress that so far we don't know of a place on Earth which is truly like Mars or any other planet or moon in our solar system. So, said this, it is true that the new discoveries on other moons and planets are largely supported and guided by the geological knowledge obtained from the study of particular analog localities on Earth. And also, it is important to consider that these planetary analogs show unique geological and environmental conditions which approximate, in specific ways, to those possibly encountered on other celestial bodies at the present time or earlier in their geological histories. So, it is important to emphasize that the analogs can be related with the current situation of Mars or any other planetary body, but also with the past. So we can define different type of uh, analogs, analogies, in connection with different moments in the evolution of the planet. In fact, a same locality can uh, contain different possibilities of analogs, because Maybe in the beginning the area was a river, then it changed to a, a lake, and then to an evaporitic area. So the same locality can be used in accordance with different terrestrial planets. And this is a very important, important change of the conception of a, of a, of a terrestrial analog, because now the concept is changing. Well, many states have been used with this purpose, with different perspectives. For example, the, we, you know, Antarctica, Rio Tinto, Atacama, Australia, Jaroso, Svalbard, among others. Uh, of course, they are also important, not only for defining scientific model, but also for testing new instrumentation, applying ethical, bioethical and geoethical protocols, uh, uh, geoethical approaches. And, uh, well, as I mentioned, Mars is going to be the example that we are going to use here. But before showing the features on Mars and the comparison, I made a search about this subject because I like to do it for my presentations, uh, for the different concepts, to know what's the state of the art, what is the situation of the terms uh, now in the scientific literature. So I was searching in the Web of Science, you know, this database, and I uh, crossed the terms planetary and analog from 1864 to present moment. And we have a number, I think it's important to consider this evolution. This is the number of records. The number of records is more than 2,000 records, 2,000 publications connecting planetary and analog. Uh, the first research uh, area are astronomy and astrophysics, instruments and also instrumentation, and geochemistry and geophysics, and geology, etc., etc. So this can give you uh, a general flavor about which are the main subjects, the main areas in which these two terms are involved, the planetary and analog. <coughs> With regards to the countries, uh, of course, USA, France, Germany, England, UK, Italy, and this is the, the relation of, of, of numbers, of records. With regards to field institutions, the, of course, NASA and the Caltech, the California State uh, Institute of Technology, or, or the CNRS, Caltech again, JPL. So, and the, the field source titles, these are the journals in which you can find the information, is Icarus, Astrophysical Journal, and Planetary and Space Science. These are the main of, in Journal of Physical Research Planets. These are the four main journals in which the terms planetary and analog appear together, connected in the terms, the ter because the search is in the title and in the abstract and in the keywords. So the search is made in the title of the, of the publication, in the abstract and also in the keywords. A second search was relating Mars and analog. Here the number de decreases a little bit, you know, is less than 2,000. Uh, the research areas are astronomy and astrophysics. Geology appears as second discipline. And also geochemistry and geophysics. 
in accordance with the, with the countries, USA, England, Germany, France, more or less the same, in accordance with the source titles, Icarus, Journal of Geophysical Research Planets is the second in this case, not the fourth, Planetary and Space Science, Astrobiology, this is very important, uh, how connecting Mars and analog astrobiology appears as the fourth journal in which studies or publications exist about this, and in connection with institutions, of course, NASA, the Ames Research Center, Caltech, JPL, etc. And finally, this is the third slide about this uh, uh, bibliographic uh, study, if we merge astrobiology and analog, we obtain only 320 records, which is not so many, uh, so many records, so I think it's important field in which we have to consider to increase our activity. So the, the connection between analogs and astrobiology. The research areas are astronomy and astrophysics, engineering and geology. The first country is USA, France in the second position here, and England. And in connection with the source titles, astrobiology of course is the first journal in this case. Icarus, astrophysical journal and planetary and space science. And uh, with regards to institutions, uh, of course, NASA, Impression Center, uh, and the CNRS, the Caltech, etc., etc. So we have a certain general idea about how is the situation, the state of the art about this, this subject. Of course, uh, there are more books. I have brought here some references, important references. For example, the, the book about analogs for planetary exploration. I was uh, one of the reviewers of this book in the, in, the, in the Geological Society of America, some books about Mars analog research, some uh, studies about the analog space research in Hawaii, for example, we want to develop in, in Spain a similar one in Lanzarote, it would be the first in Europe and the second in the world, and also probably you know this book, this book is very good, I recommend you, is the cafe, is the concepts for activities in the field for exploration. It's a very uh, few, uh, there is a few selection of analogs, but it's important. It's important, of course, we have to increase the number of analogs because uh, as we are going to see, there are many possibilities to use different types of aspects in connection with the analogies. Okay, this is this is taken, this table is taken from the CAFE, from this catalogue European of the European Space Agency, and as you see, it's used for the Moon and for Mars, and all the uh, features are related with geological aspects, craters, ejecta, melt sheets, hydrothermal deposits, gullies, crater lakes, uh, lava flows, polygonal terrains, dust devils, jardins, dunes, galleys, deltas, fans. So this is the point. The point is to try to find these similarities or these differences uh, between Mars and Earth in this, in this uh, concept. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the concept of planetary analog is changing. In fact, it's evolving, in my opinion, from the classical geographic context of a locality, of a site, to a wider perspective from micro to micro scale and considering materials and processes and also habitability issues in astrobiology from microbes to hum humans. So in this, in this regards we can use minerals, textures of minerals and of rocks, rocks, petrologic context, geological and geomorphological structures, volcanoes, mountains, dunes, lava tubes, craters, locations combining different aspects, geological processes, different types of extreme environments, the earth as a whole, the earth as a model, field work conditions also, and in particular this part is the significance of time and overlapping of processes that I mentioned in the beginning, how different processes or different materials can be combined in the same locality. So the concept of analog is changing, not only showing the features of a specific locality, of a specific site, like Rio Tinto, or Atacama, or Sahara Desert, or Halfton Impact Crater, but the materials and the processes which occur in the site. Okay, we can enter now to, to the connection of the Earth and Mars. Well, as you know, the Mars analogs 
Well, the information that we obtain from Mars comes from three uh, pillars. Uh, the research uh, the, the, of Mars meteorites, Mars meteorites which come directly from the red planet to the Earth. You know that there are different types of meteorites, the, Sher the SNC, Sher uh, the Shergotite, the Naclite and Chasignite are the three mainly types of Martian meteorites and of course the ALH001 is another type from Mars missions of course and also for from Mars analogs. This is the, th the third pillar in which we can obtain information. There, there is a fourth pillar which is now, now rising up, is the study of uh, 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 features about Mars and about procedures using these planetary mass chambers. This is a picture of the, of the, of the chambers area of the CAB, of the Centro de Astrobiología in Spain, in which we, we can uh, have the chance of uh, simulating the features on Mars, introducing CO2, introducing material and making some analysis simulating that we are on the surface of the, of the red planet. Okay? So considering this connect, the general connection between the Earth and Mars, we can make this comparison Earth and Mars, uh, considering the, the, the Martian lithospheric dichotomy, so this is a very broad connection, very broad link, but in a certain way on Mars the lithospheric crust of the southern highlands is thicker than in the northern lowlands, resembling in a certain way the model of terrestrial thick continental crust and thin oceanic crust. So in a certain way our planet as a whole could serve, could be used as a model, as a general model, comparing this continental crust and oceanic crust. So this is Mars at present. You know Mars is mainly a volcanic planet. Yeah, in fact, it's a, it's a big volcanic bowl. Uh, here you have the, 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 the Tarsis area and this is the Olympus Mons. You know the Olympus Mons is the largest volcano in the solar system. The size is, is, is huge, is uh, almost 25 uh, kilometers uh, in height and the, the base is around 500 kilometers, it's like France more or less, or like Iberian Peninsula. But as you know Mars was very different in the past, so all models indicate uh, that in the past uh, Mars had conditions similar to the uh, uh, conditions here at, at the present moment in our planet with an hydrologic and hydrogeological system similar to the system on the Earth. So this is a representation of how Mars could be with uh, some glaciers, with hydrothermal systems, with lakes and with a giant ocean covering, probably covering the North Hemisphere. So Mars surface so many still shows many geomorphological and mineralogical features which are indicative of this weather past. And this is important for the use of a specific analogue or another specific analogue. The information that we have of course is very scarce, at, uh, at least for the moment. We need much more investigation. This is the information about the international uh, chronostratigraphic chart here on Earth. It's very recent, of the, of the last year. And as you see, we can define more than 100 of stages in the different periods. So here on Earth, we are able to identify different environments, different changes and different stages along the history of our planet. On Mars, this is still very difficult to do this, for this comparison. If we uh, show a synthesis of the, the uh, column of the Earth and on Mars, we can make this time of assignment. We can have here the, you know, the Archean, the Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic. And here on Mars, you know, the Noachian, the Hesperian and the Amazonian which in a certain way could be assigned to the Philosian and Taikian 
and a Siderikian. Okay? So, different types connected with the existence of different minerals. Here, for example, the Noachian covering clay minerals, sulfates mainly covered by Esperian, and uh, the Siderikian corresponding to the Amazonian with anhydrous ferric oxides. So, this is a model of uh, uh, Professor Jean Pierre Pibrin and other colleagues. <coughs> And this is more or less the, 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 the distribution of these epochs on Mars, the Amazonian, the Spurian, and the Noachian, here with the colors. And this would be more or less the evolution of the different environments. It is important to have in mind these environments because the environments are going to give, give us the habitability conditions, in particular the environments related with the presence of liquid water. So we have the, during early Noachian, the accretion of Mars ends and start, the cratering starts. Then during the middle Noachian, the cratering, the water flooding of surface begins. During the late Noachian, the cratering, early Asperian, early heavy impact cratering ends. During the late Asperian, liquid water begins to disappear from surface. And in the middle Amazonian, liquid water is no longer present on surface. So, being conservative, it is estimated that during the first, uh, during the first giga ani, Mars uh, had water, liquid water on the surface during the first giga ani. So we don't know exactly if this is time enough for life uh, uh, merge and evolve, but we have uh, 1,000 million years at least for this, for this possibility. Well, here uh, Athena this morning presented some slides connecting uh, Titan with the Earth. I'm going to say uh, some words about these connections uh, with regards to different uh, possibilities of analogs, for example, uh, with volcanism and hydrothermalism. This is the Nili Patera caldera, you know, here. And here there are some mineralizing hydrothermal deposits. We have a similar structure with similar feature here in the volcán de El Corazoncito. El Corazoncito is the little heart, it's in Spanish, it's in Lanzarote. Here we have San Mars with two A's, no Mars, Mars. The Mars are structures related with hydrovolcanic processes, which are uh, represented here, for example, this is in the Calatrava volcanic field in Spain, different moars, different structures, and these are similar structures which have been identified in Australia, for example here, or on Mars here. We can have also some similarities, like for example fluvial systems, which are very good examples about the superficial runoff of liquid water, not only minerals, as, as we will see, but also these geomorphological features, fluvial systems, uh, systems and, and gullies. And this is the typical terrestrial fluvial system. Or, for example, here at the border of, in the border of a, of a crater, or here in some sharp uh, uh, places in our planet, we can have, I don't know if you can see here, the structure. This is like an alluvial fan or a delta is very well defined on Mars, and this is the, the typical terrestrial example. So in a certain way, we can have these similarities to try to find what's the best example in the world. In this case, we can use different uh, alluvial fans or different deltas, not only in, in one specific place. We, we have to compare the features of these deltas or alluvial fans in different parts of the world. Well. With regards to the materials on Mars, it would be related with volcanic rocks. So this would be much more appropriate. Oh, for example, analogs uh, uh, related with atmospheric processes, like these uh, dust devils. Now, uh, I think that it was the last week, uh, NASA provided a, a new picture about dust devils in the, in the Gale Crater, where the curiosity is now and this is in Nevada, also some dunes here in Brazil or in, on Mars. Of course, some sedimentary structures like cross bedding, for example, uh, the formation of these ripples 
ripple marks indicative of, of these conditions that we see here. We can identify these, these uh, structures also on Mars and these are the same structures as fossil structures, sedimentary structures. Of course, the secation processes. So the idea is that uh, uh, geologists uh, can have this uh, uh, representation of similarities and differences between different sites and different geological processes and materials. Of course, impact craters. This is the Aweju in Mauritania. I was working there, here. For example, veins. This means that there was here a crack, a, a crack which was infilled with, with a fluid and the fluid precipitated uh, its shark forming these minerals. In this case, this is uh, calcium sulfate on Mars and this is also calcium sulfate in the Jaroso area in the southeast part of Spain. So, as you can see, it's also quite similar. Oh, probably you remember this picture. This picture is the, the, uh, the outcrop name here, with this name in Spanish, El Capitan. In El Capitan, this was the discovery made by the Opportunity rover, uh, which wa was one of the rovers of the twin rovers. The Spirit was uh, directed was addressed to a, a model linked to a, a paleo crater with evaporitic materials. The spirit was to the Gusev crater and the opportunity was uh, sent to an area in which the hematite had been discovered by Phil Christensen and other authors and hydrothermal area. So and here and this area in Meridiani Planum they analyzed this outcrop, the outcrop of El Capitan, and they found this, I think it's very difficult to see here, these blue berries here, some spheres, spheroidal textures, and these textures were rich in whiteite, in hematite, and also in a mineral called gerosite. So gerosite was, this discovery was made in 2004, where the, when the opportunity uh, reached the area. And Jarosite is important because uh, we were working here in the Jaroso Ravine and Jarosite is a mineral which was discovered in Spain as a type locality in the Jaroso Ravine, in the Jaroso hydrothermal systems. So the, ter the term is not Jarosite, it's Jarosita, it's in, Sp in Spanish, you know. So, uh, and this was very important because we know here that Jarosite requires the presence of liquid water to be formed. So it was probably the smallest evidence but the, the most important one about the existence of liquid water because this mineral requires the presence of liquid water to form. After the discovery of gerocide there are other areas which have been mapped for the identification of different minerals like gypsum, in Olympia and the region, clay minerals, chloride minerals, or silica rich soil, or much more recently carbonates, for example. You know that this discovery of carbonates was also a first because in the beginning it was thought that Mars had a very low pH with a conditions very similar to the Rio Tinto area in Spain, very acidic environment, and so there were even uh, some important publications in Nature and Science and other journals indicating the, the impossibility of formation of carbonates on Mars. So uh, this is indicated that Mars is much more geodiverse in accordance with the geological processes that expected and that we can find carbonates uh, probably from different origins because carbonates you know here on Earth uh, can be formed from sedimentary processes, but also, for example, for, uh, from hydrothermal, like siderite, hydrothermal uh, processes. Well, in the context of this comparison that I was mentioning, because I, I think I was privileged, I was able to work on different sites, uh, like in Costa Rica, in Svalbard, in Iceland, in the Antarctica, in Mauritania, 
we were doing different. I'm going to show you some, some pictures about our work in these areas. And also in Spain, of course, in Rio Tinto, in the Gulf of Cadiz, in the Canary Islands, mainly in Tenerife and Lanzarote, in the Yaroso area, uh, where the Yarosite was discovered and identified for the first time, in the Campos de Calatrava, the Calatrava volcanic field. This, for example, is, is the prototype of the booms one and two, which are now uh, uh, working on Mars. Uh, in, in REMS, in the Rover Environmental Monitoring Station, or in Bujaraloz, when we also tested the working of the, of, of the uh, temperature sensor, the ground temperature sensor. So the, these are some pictures, only some of them. This was a study that we uh, made in the Antarctica in 2000, many years ago, 17 years ago. We were uh, doing the investigation of the of the vents and the volcanic, and we identify the anomalies of iron and ars arsenic, and also we saw some connection between microbes and microorganisms which uh, were living in connection with these anomalies, with these iron and arsenic anomalies. So even in these harsh conditions of the Antarctic Peninsula, in the Deception Island we found these uh, microbes, these colonies of uh, microbes living here. This was the, we, we, we had the support of the divers of the army to take some samples because you know the temperature is very cold and it was uh, totally formidal, forbidden to, to dive more than uh, five minutes. So this was in, uh, more recently in 2007. This was the, the exploration and study of, uh, of uh, impact craters in the Sahara Desert. In the, this is the crater, the Iowa impact crater, and it's around uh, 500 uh, meters in diameter. We were studying the well, the mineralogy and the geochemistry associated with the rocks and the minerals in the interior and also in the ring of the crater. This is a simple impact crater. You know that they are simple and, and simple and complex impact craters. This was, for example, in Iceland. This is, well, this is not Mars, of course. This is Lorena. <laughs> this is uh, on Earth. This is the dean of the Faculty of Geology in Madrid. But you can see that the, 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 the textures, the colors, the minerals are quite similar. This is the Gusev crater. When these silica-rich minerals with this opal uh, was discovered by the spirit uh, uh, rover. And this is in, in Iceland with that uh, very peculiar paragenesis, probably very similar to the paragenesis that we are going to see uh, in Dalol this, this afternoon, in particular at these areas. Of course, this is the, the star uh, site in Spain, probably you know, Rio Tinto is an acidic fluvial system. We were working in connection with NASA with two groups to try to identify life on Rio Tinto. And we succeeded, so we found life in the Tinto River. This is in the Gulf of Cadiz. In the Gulf of Cadiz, this site is very interesting because the existence of hydrocarbons and methanogenic vents. These vents uh, give rise to the formation of, the, of nodules and also submarine nodules and also chimneys of uh, methanogenic carbonates. So the carbonates are formed from the methane. Okay. So, and but the most important aspect of these uh, structures is that in their interior we were able to find these thromboids of magnetite and pyrite, and the idea was to try to identify biomarkers of the uh, uh, microbes and the archaea and the bacteria, you know, the typical consortium of these areas, like in the Gulf of Mexico, that uh, were living here. And we identify some important uh, carbon compounds in the interior of these minerals. And it's curious because we identified this sequence 
in which a framboid starts to be formed, step by step is taking uh, the final shape. Even some phases indicated that it's a mineral, but unless we analyze in detail the interior of the crystal, we are not able to see that this crystal was formed thanks to the participation of the bacteria. So it is important to understand what happened in the interior of sun crystals, because maybe we can find similar things on Mars. Well, this is the Jaroso, as you see the Jaroso area, it's the world type locality of Jarosite. The Jaroso is also important because simultaneously we can find siderite and Jarosite in the same sample, uh, carbonates and sulfates corresponding to different pHs. So, and this is important because it means different pulses and hydrothermal pulse was rich in SO2 and formed the gerocyte and other hydrothermal pools was uh, rich in CO2 and for the carbonate. Okay, so it's possible to find in the same sample uh, to open your mind on Mars and not only to, to find gerocyte or only carbonate because the, the nature is much more geodiverse in, in the same locality you can find both things simultaneously corresponding to different uh, stages in time. This is in the Calatrava volcanic field in central Spain. We also were studying with people from, from CAP. Here the, the, this uh, material, fragmentary material from the volcanoes with a, a GTS, with a temperature sensor. In the, in the Canary Islands in Tenerife, this is more in connection with the ExoMars with Professor uh, Fernando Rull, who is uh, building the, the, the Raman spectrometer which uh, will fly uh, in ExoMars. This is Professor Klinkelhofer. You know Klinkelhofer was the person who built the Mosbauer spectrometer uh, with which we identify the gerocyte on Mars. So we were working in collaboration with uh, Gostar Klinkelhofer and Professor Jose Antonio Rodriguez Lozada from the University of La Laguna and these are uh, studies with the portable spectrometers. We have different portable spectrometers and it's possible to make directly in the field LIPS analysis and also Raman analysis in the way that we can combine the results in the field and compare if the results are good or not good in connection with the same results analyzing the same samples in the lab. This, this area is called Los Azulejos, Los Azulejos in Spanish, due to the colors, because it, it was very easy to follow the hydrothermal alteration of the volcanic rocks with the colors of the, of the, of the upper part of the volcanic material. Well, we also mm, uh, supervise several theses, PhD thesis, like in Tenerife, in the Jaroso, also with the University of Innsbruck. So, there are different possibilities, different aspects in which we can we can work in connection with analogs. These uh, last slides correspond to the work that we are carrying out now in Lanzarote. This is the Lanzarote Geopark. Uh, Spain is the second country in number of geoparks after China. So this can give you a general overview about the importance the geological diversity of our country. We don't have many, a lot of money, but we have a very rich geodiversity, you know. And this is the only geopark which contains a Mars corner, the Rincón de Marte, a Mars corner in which we are working. And it was recognized by UNESCO for this feature, for this characteristic. And I have brought here for you to see some of this comparison. This is Mars and this is Lanzarote. Okay. This is cha the change of volcanoes and the change of also maybe, well, the, the interpretation is maybe mud volcanoes or hydrovolcanoes on Mars. This is, well, the, the same picture, Nili Patera and the El Corazoncito Caldera. Similar structures about the gullies on Mars and here the same uh, 
galleys on the border, on the upper and the north part of uh, Lanzarote. Some peculiar and extremophily lakes. This is the interpretation of a lake close to the mountain, to the Mount Sharp in the Gale Crater on Mars. And this is uh, the Green Lake in Lanzarote. It's a very extremophilic lake, very strange conditions. It's, this is a, a, a crater, the part of a crater, which was destroyed by the erosion. This, this is a network. It's almost a stopwork. It's a network of, of fractures. This is on, on Mars, for, of course. This with the notebook is on Earth. <laughs> this is in Lanzarote also, in the basal part of the island. And this is uh, another aspect in Lanzarote in which we have just started to work, is the connection of the study of the lava tubes, because you know that lava tubes were identified on Mars, and this is important from the astro astrobiological point of view, because lava, lava tubes could be special sites in which life, in case of existing, could be protected from UV radiation, for example, in a special environment with special temperature and pressure. And also we have a network of lava tubes in Lanzarote uh, in different parts of the island. This is one of them in which with water and with, without water. So it is important to study, and this is just in the beginning, to study the microbial communities, the mineralogy, the alteration, everything in the interior of the lava tubes. Well, in this context, uh, the European Space Agency contacted us to develop the Pangea program. The Pangea program is the planetary analog geological and astrobiological exercise for astronauts. This is a panoramic view of the Timanfaya National uh, Park with the, you know, this similar to the reels, sin sinuous reels. Everything is volcanic. This is natural color of the area. And this was a project, a program of the European Space Agency in collaboration with our institution, in collaboration with UNESCO and with the Lanzarote Geopark, with the Lanzarote authorities. This was just the, the last year, the November uh, 2016. 16. So uh, we were 10 instructors uh, from Europe and we uh, had uh, three very, we were privileged because we had three astronauts as students. We had uh, Pedro Duque from Spain, Luca Parmitano is uh, from uh, Italy, and Matthias Maurer, we, who wasn't an astronaut in that moment, but now he's officially an astronaut. It was a question of uh, a couple of months. He's a, uh, he was, or oh, he's a a, a material engineer and now a, an ESA astronaut. So they are the three astronauts in the in the area of Timanfaya. This is Matias, Luca and Pedro. And well, maybe assessing present and past habitability is not an easy task. And for this reason, I think we need uh, many more terrestrial analogs. So thank you very much for your attention.